Right, so I'm going to give an overview of the first four weeks of the eSecurity module. So in this part, we're going to cover some uh, cryptography fundamentals. So there'll be four weeks. First week, uh, we'll do some fundamental areas around cryptography. Second week, we'll look at secret key encryption and hashing. And then we'll build on that to look at public key encryption, digital certificates and key exchange. And then in week four, we'll have a look at uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Okay, so to give a basic overview of, of how all this these technologies fit in together, uh, let's look at, uh, at what we would find if, we're if Bob is communicating with Alice. So the fundamental thing is that we typically use what's called symmetric key encryption or secret key encryption to be able to encrypt uh, data between Bob and Alice. So we have uh, Bob here and Alice. And then we use secret key encryption or symmetric key encryption, such as AES, DES or 3DES, to be able to encrypt between Bob and Alice. So these, these are what you would define as the workhorse of encryption. They're fast methods which are highly efficient and allow us to be able to uh, encrypt and decrypt uh, data fairly fast using uh, keys. But there needs to be some way to get the key between Bob and Alice. Either we can have a static key that uh, that both Bob and Alice store, but there must be some way for them to negotiate what that key actually is. So it could be password based, we could generate it based on a password that uh, Bob and Alice know. But normally what we would do is that we would create what's called a key exchange. So a key exchange, Bob and Alice communicate openly, even though Eve is listening, and then at the end of it they have the same shared key. Okay, so this key may be a long-term key, or it could be a short-term key, such as only for one uh, session. Okay, so those are the two core methods that, that we would use. And then we need some way to be able to authenticate or identify uh, Bob to Alice and vice versa. And also to, for Alice to know that the messages haven't been changed. For, so for this, we have what's called public key encryption. So with public key encryption, we use a key pair, a public key and a private key. And then Bob signs something with his private key and then sends a message, uh, a signature to Alice. And then Alice then proves Bob's identity with the, the public key. So we'll find this is used fairly extensively and we'll find it within what's called the PKI or the public key infrastructure. But we'll also be able to see it in terms of things like cryptocurrencies and blockchain and so on. Okay, so that's our basic model of our infrastructure. We'll come back to this later. So if we look at the, the four main areas that, uh, that we can classify, is within secret key or symmetric encryption. The same key is used on either side. Okay, AES, RC4, 3DES, AES, and so on are typical methods that we use here. Then we have what's called symmetric encryption or public key encryption, where we have one key to encrypt, and then another key will then decrypt, and they're used together defined as a, as a key pair. RSA, LGAMO, uh, and so on, and elliptic curve are typical methods that we use here. Then we need some way to authenticate our data to make sure that it hasn't been changed. So we have what's called a one-way function or a one-way hash function. So it should be possible mathematically uh, within a reasonable time constraint to be able to reverse back to our original. But as we'll see with things like rainbow tables and dictionary attacks, it's not too difficult to be able to reverse that process. So in a hashing function, we have things like MD5, SHA1, SHA3, uh, and, and so on. And then finally, we have a way to be able to translate our data into one form or another 
Typically, we need to translate it into a form such as an ASCII uh, from from binary f uh, format into ASCII. So we have base sixty four hex octal Unicode and so on. Okay, so let's look at the the manias that we'll we'll look at uh, for each of the weeks. So for fundamentals, we we can't not cover traditional ciphers. Uh, and to understand how these methods actually work. So Caesar codes and scrambled alphabets and so on were a traditional cipher. And it's important with inside cryptography that we do still understand some of the methods that were actually used in there. So as part of that, we'll look at some frequency analysis and to be able to crack some codes. But most of what we're looking at is key-based encryption. Then we'll look at some basic encoding methods. Uh, Base64 is a common one for us to be able to uh, translate our data and our keys into that would give us some sort of a text format that we can send through email and so on. Then we'll look at uh, GCD, or Greatest Common uh, Denominator, and we'll find out that uh, GCD is used uh, quite often to make sure that two values do not share the same factor or the GCD is equal to 1, the greatest common denominator is equal to 1. An important element with inside uh, cryptography is the generation of random numbers, so they can be real true random numbers or they can be pseudo random numbers and it's important for us to understand these and how they're generated because our keys are typically created through some sort of random number generation. Then, as we'll see later on, prime numbers are used a lot. We'll find they're used in RSA and also in discrete uh, logarithms. In cryptography, we don't really deal with the normal types of numbers. We deal with what are called the big integers. These numbers, typically we deal with 64-bit numbers in, uh, in our normal uh, processing. Well, in this area, we might deal with 4,096-bit numbers. So the computation becomes quite difficult. But luckily, we have a friend in Python, and we'll find that Python is a great language for uh, uh, implementing our cryptography. And we like to keep things nice and simple in cryptography, but also to make sure that things are done correctly. So the main operators that we use are mod, that's the remainder, of a division, XOR, the XOR function is like a little adder function, and then the bit shift ones. Okay, so that, that will be our fundamentals, and we'll cover that in our, in our first week. Then we'll go on to secret key encryption, as we said, the workhorse of what goes on if we have Bob and Alice. Then the encrypted data that we send is typically using something like ES or 3DES, or a whole lot of uh, of algorithms. There's even a method called cha cha, which is which is also used. Then we'll look at uh, whether we should take blocks of data and encrypt the blocks, or we should just operate on a stream or or the ones and zeros as they come along. So AES is a block cipher, where something like cha cha is a stream cipher. Stream ciphers are much faster. Than, than block ciphers. <coughs> <coughs> okay, so we'll look at uh, the basic methods that are involved, AES, death, redes, and so on. So we've implemented a whole lot of them, and you'll have the opportunity through Python to be able to implement your own. So one thing we'll find is that when we encrypt, uh, we need to make sure that the output is forever changing, even for the same input. So we bring in a concept called salting, which makes sure that every time we encrypt, that we get a different output, even though our input is actually the same. Then we'll look at AES in a little bit more detail and look at the, the runs that it goes through and how it scrambles. It uses what's called an S-box to be able to create the scrambling process and does some row uh, uh, row changing and column changing and it scrambles on on either side uh, and we're able to to reverse on the other side then we'll look at uh, des 3des and see how that works 
Then finally, we'll look at the true strength of our cryptography, which is to measure the key entropy. What is the equivalent size of the key that we've actually used, and is it crackable? Then from there, we'll look at uh, our one-way uh, hashing function, look at the basic methods that, that we use, and how we would crack it, either through rainbow tables or dictionary type attacks, or perhaps a fundamental weakness with inside uh, our hashing method. So the methods that look at MD5, SHA1, SHA3, LM hash, and then some great hashing methods which are quite challenging in terms of performance, bcrypt and pbkdfs2. These methods are the ones that we'll find are the most uh, secure in terms of uh, storing a secret password. Again, we'll look at salting uh, of, of hashing so that we can make sure that we make it more difficult uh, to, for, for, for them not to be cracked. From there, we'll look at the basic formats of uh, hash passwords and see in which way they store the salt and the hashed value and then the basic process of how we take a password and convert it into a hashed password. Then we'll look at uh, things like timed one-time passwords, which are, are, are useful in terms of, of creating authentication on the system. And then finally, we'll look at message authentication codes where we can actually sign, sign a hashed value. This will then build into public key encryption. So as we said with public encryption, we have a public key and then we have a private key. Okay. Uh, the thing you shouldn't do is ever release your private key. Okay. If you release your private key, then uh, your, your data will be insecure. You could lose your bitcoins and, and so on. Okay, the public key is the key which is used to authenticate uh, you or prove your identity. So look at the basic principles of public key encryption, how we sign, but also how we use the, uh, the, the private key to authenticate and how we can use the, the private key to be able to perform a key exchange. From there, we'll look at the basic principles of RSA uh, and how it actually works. We'll go through a very simple uh, example and then we'll touch base a little bit with the elliptic curve which is used uh, fairly extensively now. It's used in the, the Tor network, it's used in IoT and in many of the new applications of public key encryption you'll find elliptic key in there because RSA is just becoming so difficult to, to deal with because of its computational resource. These methods could be cracked by quantum computers, so it's important to understand where their current limits and future limits lie. Okay, in the end, we'll look at how we can create signed emails and also create secure emails using the PGP uh, uh, protocol. So it's unbelievable that at, at, in this time after, after the internet has been created for so long, that we still have trouble identifying the, the sender of, of an email. So PGP will show us one method that we can uh, implement in order to create secure email systems. Then we'll look at the difficult area of digital certificates. And it's uh, an area that f uh, unfortunately few people really properly understand, and especially how we create the public key infrastructure of trust we have a hierarchy of trust levels on the internet for the signing of certificates and we need to understand how this trust level is actually used. So we'll also have a look at how we create signed certificates uh, and how they can be trusted, uh, especially when we see something like the HTTPS uh, in a web browser. Can we really trust that? and what are the risks involved. As I said, we need to find methods to be able to create the same uh, secret key, or the same symmetric key on either side, so that Eve can't tell what that, uh, that key actually is. And uh, the implementation of this is to look at key exchange methods where 
where Bob and Alice can communicate fairly openly and then eventually they'll end up with the same shared key. So as I said, this could be for one session or for a certain time limit or it could be a long-term key that, that, we, that we generate. So we'll look at key exchange uh, methods and then how we use uh, key exchange methods to be able to pass a secret key. And then finally, we'll look at uh, some evolving areas such as blockchain and cryptocurrencies, especially to look at the basic principles of what cryptocurrencies and blockchain, and blockchain methods are, and to look at examples of Bitcoin, Ripple, and, and so on. But then to look mainly at uh, Ethereum and especially at the, the, the implementation of smart contracts and how we can build trusted infrastructures from from them okay so that's that's an outline of the areas that we'll be looking at uh, there is a website here which has many of the of the methods involved uh, but what you'll find is that each week there is a, a, a web page uh, which will outline uh, the basic methods and the key learning outcomes that are involved. Okay, so for week one, the important place to look is at what you should know at the end of the unit. So this will give you an idea of what it is we're trying to outline as part of the as part of the, the unit. Okay, so so the, in in this first unit, you'll find that these are the the five main things that we 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 will get. So the lecture will contain lots of other things that give you a background, but those are the key things that we need to understand. Then there'll be a presentation and a, and a video that uh, that you need to watch and review. Then uh, you, there is a lab part. So there's normally two parts to the element. One is the core part about uh, learning the fundamentals of the techniques that we're looking at. So that normally involves uh, that normally involves connecting to a virtual machine and implementing a few of the uh, the, the the theoretical parts. And then there's also a little practical lab that you can do. This lab is based on Python code and will allow you to code some of the ideas together. We won't uh, assess you on the Python part, but it's a very important part to be able to understand some of the, the fundamentals. Then there'll be a few little tests and you can watch the, the video. Along with this, there's a little bit of book work where you could have a look at a tutorial and try and uh, implement these things and ask questions if you have any problems with them. There's some answers here. Okay, so I'll be on, on Skype if you need to contact me uh, or you can send an email. Make sure that you use the, sub, the module number as part of the subject field. Okay, thank you and I hope you have an interesting time uh, learning the subject.